America's Game, a countdown of the 20 greatest Super Bowl champions. And now, number 11. One of the more entertaining divisions in professional football the last several seasons has been the NFC East. The Cowboys, the Redskins, and the Cardinals have waged their own version of a holy war with the Giants and the Eagles always bringing up the rear. But this year, the Cowboys have been established as a heavy preseason favorite to win that division because on the day of the draft, without disturbing their team, they were able to give to Seattle three draft choices in exchange for a Heisman Trophy winner. We have never had uh, the real big back, the, the breakaway back, the back that can make the big play. We've just been lacking that, uh, that one added dimension. And I think that is the dimension that will be added to the Cowboys by Tony Dorsett. Failure in the running game cost Tom Landry's Cowboys in a loss to the Steelers in Super Bowl X. The next year, another playoff power outage at running back short-circuited Dallas against the Rams. The losses magnified their need for a game-breaking run. We're one player away from winning the Super Bowl. And I promise you, if it was ever true, it was true for that 77 team. We had this puzzle. And the puzzle doesn't work unless, you know, every piece plays a role in the puzzle. And we were missing one piece. And that was Tony Dorsett. Oh, uh, no, 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 no. I'm not the final piece of this puzzle. I'm just a guy just trying to fit in. I mean, they already had all these great, great players. These all pro players and guys that are highly visible in, in the National Football League. So I was just trying to blend in. You see him for the first time. You're wondering, what? <laughs> this little guy? And then you're a little skeptical because now he's in the pros. And you look at his uh, small stature and he's wondering if he can do the same things on a professional level that he did on a college level. Tony Dorsett was always a star. He was the nation's best high school player, an NCAA champion, and Heisman Trophy winner at the University of Pittsburgh, and the number one pick of America's team. Coming in as a Heisman Trophy winner with a lot of hoopla, I knew there was going to be uh, some people trying to test me. There was going to be a lot of eyes upon me, and. And I might get challenged. I know he had a certain uh, air, arrogance about him. He had an air about him that uh, he, had, he did have a sense of entitlement. And he, too, looked at the Cowboy team and knew that he was probably the best talent at the running back spot. So he wanted the job. It just didn't work that way. Uh, you weren't ever uh, just handed a job. You had to earn it. He was a prima donna. He was a sweet-looking, running son of a gun. And... Uh, an arrogant guy like me, a self-promoting guy like me, didn't mind. Um, I just wish I'd have got his money. You know, he got way more money than I did. We had to bring him down a notch. And uh, Coach Landry was very good at doing that. Dorsett was beaten up in summer camp and beaten down by head coach Tom Landry. Tom doesn't want prima donnas, and Tom has a way of uh, humbling people, they, they would tell me. And, you know, you got to do this and do that, and he's just going to test you. He plays these mind games, and I got down on myself and, and was really, really, really in the dumps. <laughs> Everyone else was sky high. This perfect mix of emerging stars and veteran all pros expected to reach the Super Bowl. Coach Landry ran our team like a corporation. 
We had goals. We had methods to obtain the goals. We had critical points to obtain the methods that attained the goals. And then we had the individual exact details to perform the critical points, to perform the methods, to perform the goal. And the goal was to win the Super Bowl. Always in the spotlight, Tony Dorsett began the season as a spot player. It was not the cold, but the war horse, Preston Pearson, number 26, who started at running back. With Pearson at running back, Dallas cruised through the early season. I think Preston Pearson was raising a little hell uh, that I'm the guy, I know this system, and you know, you, you can't just put this guy in front of me. He took a lot of pride in the fact that he was keeping a player like Tony Dorsett on the bench. Here's uh, Roger back to throw across the middle. Preston Pearson, wide open, touchdown. Oh, my goodness, he was all by himself, four yards deep. Coach Landry knew he could always insert Tony in certain situations. So he kind of handled him with kid gloves, only using him in certain situations in games, using him on certain plays that he was very familiar with. Hand off, Dorsett, right guard to the 10, to the 5, touchdown! We knew eventually that Tony would be the man, and it was just a matter of time before he took over. In a reserve role, Dorsett scored twice against the Giants and displayed the explosive running the team had sorely lacked. I didn't like the way the media w was handling uh, the whole scenario from the standpoint of when I come into a game, they're expecting these miraculous things to happen. As a running back, that's not the way it goes. It wasn't a situation where he had to come in and be the savior. You know, we had a good football team. In the fourth week, Dorsett was still not starting, but he revolutionized traditional cowboy running philosophy. My whole thing was, look, I am a runner. I run to daylight. I run to what I see. And it always not going to be like you, you draw up X's and O's. We were running practice, and I'm rolling this thing, and our, our defense, you know, playing the mock defense of the Cardinals, they were, they were moving, and so they went, and I seen it, it broke all the way back across, back behind the center. It will never, it will never in a hundred years ever break like that. Stay on side, no, 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 I'm to, I got to run to what I see. I rolled slant 24, and it broke back just like he said it would never break in a hundred years. I go 77 yards for a touchdown. To the 50, the 40, he's to the 30, the 20, the 10, the 5, Tony Dorsett, touchdown! Cowboy runners were expected to slam into the proper hole, but it was Dorsett's ability to improvise, to transform losses into touchdowns, that made the little man unique. Coach Landry changed the way he coached. When Tony Dorsett showed him that he could cut back against the grain or get through holes that that nobody else has ever gotten through before. And the next day in the meeting, Coach Landry comes in and he says, okay, Tony's a different type of runner. What you guys are going to have to do as offensive linemen, you're just going to have to put your hats on your guy and keep your hat on him, and he's going to run to what he sees. From that point on, I never had another problem. I was able to be become... TD, be myself. Tom Landry allowed Randy White to be himself when he moved number 54 to defensive tackle. For two seasons, White was imprisoned at linebacker while Dr. Frankenstein tried to build him into a monster, a monster like Dick Buckus. Like the legendary linebacker, he was ferocious, but not quite skilled enough to play the position. Randy is a down lineman. You know, he's not a guy that's comfortable playing standing up. He likes to get down in, in a four-point stance and get after people. What Dorsett added on offense, White added on defense, where he was the destructive inside force on the doomsday defense. On game day, this meek, uh, humble person turned into a monster. I mean, he was, he was ferocious 
on game day. And he scared me. I've never been afraid of anything. And Randy White scared me. White scared everyone but Thomas Henderson, a player who challenged both coaches and teammates. Thomas Hollywood Henderson was a provoker. You know, he was an instigator. He was always trying to get under somebody's skin. And he just picked the wrong guy, <laughs> you know, Randy White. Why would you want to mess with Randy White, you know? He wouldn't call the master for nothing, half man, half monster. Randy White, one of the strongest men in the National Football League. Thomas Henderson, cocaine addict. That wasn't fair. That wasn't a fair fight. Randy uh, proceeded to just to lift him up, and I think he lifted him with one arm and slammed him into the locker, and, uh, and it was over pretty quickly. He picked me up, he stuffed me in my locker, then he had me pinned to the floor. And I said to him, while well, well, he had me pinned to the floor, if you let me up, I'm gonna kick your ass. It was just, which is crazy. Randy did uh, do a number on Thomas. Uh, he was very good to him. He could have hurt him a little more if he wanted to. So he didn't pound me, he didn't hit me, he didn't whip my ass like he probably could have uh, because he knew I'd probably kill him. I mean, you know, I'd go home and get something and come back and put on his big ass. I actually think after that incident, Randy and Hollywood uh, became closer. They had a better understanding of each other. I know Hollywood had a better understanding of Randy White. <laughs> Randy White and the ferocious front four were the bedrock of the doomsday defense, the best defensive unit in the NFL. Because this defense read offenses instead of attacking them, they were labeled as soft. We would hear a lot of teams talking about us being a finesse team and, and not a physical football team. We would laugh at that and say, let's wait till Sunday and see what they say once they walk off the field. And I don't know how anybody could ever say our doomsday defense wasn't physical. Doomsday was versatile and violent, an equal opportunity bully who beat up both running backs and quarterbacks. Number 79, Harvey Martin recorded the most sacks in the NFL and was named Defensive Player of the Year. This is beautiful Harvey Martin coming to you on a pretty windy day here in a brisk, cold Dallas, Texas. And I guess you wonder why I call it the beautiful Harvey Martin show today. We couldn't figure out why it was called beautiful Harvey Martin because Harvey wasn't the greatest looking guy in the world. It was the Cowboys 5-0 and record that was truly beautiful. The team's perfect 5-0 and record in 1977 did not satisfy their perfectionist head coach. He was more of a disciplinarian than he ever was and didn't let us get away with anything. Uh, his critiques on the games, after the games we played, we would win the game 30 points or so, and we'd go to that meeting on Monday afternoon and feel like we lost. You know, he'd beat us down. He would never let us feel comfortable with what we had accomplished. It was a great motivation to avoid Coach Landry looking at you because when he'd look at you and... And, let, and you knew that he's looking at you because you did something wrong mentally, and you just wanted to crawl under the carpet. You know, it's hard to accept as a player his aloofness and uh, the fear that we had for him, being men ourselves and fearing this man. If, if you really wanted to get a picture of Tom Landry, it would be in Thousand Oaks, California, with him on that two-story apparatus with a bullhorn. That's about as close emotionally uh, that you got to him. But the dour coach hid a whimsical side. Do you know me? I'm one of the best known cowboys in Texas. But a lot of people don't recognize me in a cowboy hat. So I just carry the American Express card. It can help you out in plenty of tough situations because you never know when you're going to be surrounded by Redskins. Howdy. To apply for the card, look for this display and take one. The American Express card. Don't leave home without it. <clears throat> if he liked anybody, he probably liked me. But you know what? I had no earthly idea of knowing that. He never showed ever that he cared about any of us as an individual. Landry loved him. Now, you know, 
if you're going to look around the football team and wonder who does Landry, does he like anybody? He loved Charlie Waters. Coach Landry and I had a different rapport than Coach Landry and other players. And the reason for that was is I played quarterback in, in, in college, and, and then when I came to the pros, I played defensive back. And Coach Landry played quarterback in college, and when he came to the pros, he played defensive back. Coach Landry also played corner in the pros when he really wasn't a very good corner. He played, he was really, really good safety, real smart. And then that's just what I had to do also. Charlie Walter's journey from also ran to all pro was a painful odyssey. Coach Landry came to me and asked me to play corner. And I was a very good corner. I didn't have the speed to play corner. So he made a sacrifice to play the cornerback position, uh, even though he knew he was really a safety. He took a lot of beatings there, got humbled in a lot of ways. Uh, I remember Charlie Taylor continually beating him. Sometimes it just it didn't matter how smart you were or how much, how much technique you used. I just couldn't play out there because I didn't have the, the raw speed to, to play the cornerback spot, and I was abused. I've been exposed to a lot of hell at the cornerback spot. I got booed at Texas Stadium, and, uh, you know, uh, and that was hard. And I got beat for touchdown passes in games to where when I'd go to tr practice the next day, it, I'd have to sit in the room with the offensive team, and Coach Landry would point out that, uh, that I lost the game. And, you know, he was real blunt about those sort of things. And... So it taught me how to deal with adversity. He paid his dues at cornerback, and it's amazing that uh, it didn't ruin his psyche. Knocked down but never counted out, Waters finally earned the admiration of his head coach. Coach Lander got up in front of the team, and of course this is the game, this is a game that I lost the game for him. And, and he said to the team, he said, look, you know, Charlie had a tough day yesterday. That's an understatement. And he said, but, you know, if I'd had uh, 45 guys that tried as hard as he did, he said, I wouldn't have lost a game in my whole career of coaching. With the switch to safety in 1976, Waters became the brain behind the brawn of Doomsday. Rarely out of position, this coach on the field turned himself into an all-pro. Charlie is the smartest football player I ever played with, and uh, he had to be because he had to tell me the damn play most of the time. There's no one player I have more respect for uh, what he sacrificed for this game in the NFL to play it, as long as he played it uh, than Charlie Waters. Because we were the Dallas Cowboys, because we were America's team, we were in everybody's uh, living room, and people hated us. We won! Dallas! We hate you! Dallas! Everybody that played us, every game was like a playoff game. The hated Cowboys won their first eight games, often as the result of its special team. Waters can pick it up and run. He's got it at the 15, the 10. He cuts for the goal line. Touchdown, Cowboys! Bob Hammond waits for it at the 22, has it. Here comes the rush. He fumbles the ball. Giants pick it up and head right. Now there's another fumble. Jay Selley has it. The Cowboys had a strong supporting cast, but the lead actor remained quarterback Roger Staubach, who generaled this imaginative offense with precision. With the game on the line, Captain Comeback sought out Mr. Clutch, Drew Pearson, number 88. Pearson, an undrafted free agent quarterback, became the Cowboys' all-time leading receiver. Roger going deep for Drew down the sideline. Caught at the 25, to the 10, to the 5. Touchdown, Dallas Cowboys. And you would not believe the spike that Drew Pearson just put on that ball. Clutch. Yeah, they called him Clutch. What he brought to the Cowboys, though, was every week he vomited on the field. 
uh, you know, he threw up. Um, and I would throw up, too, if I was as skinny as he was. But he'd walk over to Tom Landry on a timeout and just throw up. And everybody on the defensive side of the ball just loved Drew Pearson because they knew how uh, tough he was as far as uh, performing on when you had to perform. You trusted him. Uh, you knew that he was going to give up his body over the middle. And he, he was a twig. He weighed 160 pounds, 150 maybe. He was just a guy you could count on. You know, I think it's a combination of things that happen that put you in a position to, to make those big plays. And uh, the number one thing is you got to have the confidence of the coach to call your number in those situations. You don't have his confidence. You definitely have to have the confidence of the quarterback. <laughs> and I had Rogers' confidence. While Pearson looked slow, no one was fast enough to catch him. With an 8-0 record, the Cowboys were primed for a rush to the playoffs, a goal the team leaders never lost sight of. He was a leader for us, uh, both on and, and, and off the field. He not only did it vocally, but he showed by example. I mean, he, he did it both, and, and you don't have many guys that do that, but he was, he was our man. For the 77 Cowboys, the glow of eight straight wins was dimmed by Tony Dorsett's failure to become the Cowboys' starting running back. Number 33 remained a pinch hitter because he could not grasp the complicated offense. 1977 seemed like a lost season for Tony Dorsett. I kind of almost gave up on, on that year, you know, until Coach Landry really pulled me in. Uh, right before that 10th game of the season and told me he had been expecting me to start by now and, and that I need to just apply myself and work and, and act like I care I, on the football field because I was down. I was down. You know, here we, we're late in the season and, and I'm not starting, so I'm, I'm not feeling very good about that. In Week 10, the NFL's most sensational substitute finally became a starter. Dorsett had earned his Cowboy Spurs and prodded Preston Pearson to the bench. Preston's a smart player, a smart individual, and he realized eventually that Tony was gonna have to be the man. So Preston got in the mode of, how can I compliment Tony Dorsett? When Tony ended up taking the job as the starting tailback from him, they moved him to the third down specialty back. Uh, and and Coach Landry had special plays set up just for Preston Pearson. He ended up being the most specialized player of the NFL. He created a new position, the third down back. With Pearson now a third down specialist, could the undersized Dorset withstand the punishment as a starter? At 175 pounds, people said, well, he's too small. He's going to be too small to take the pounding of the National Football League. All that did was put motivation into this body to make me want to prove people wrong. Yeah, I was small, but I was I always just a thin piece of leather well put together. Tony was a power back. Not many people know that we ran him in third and one an awful lot. He was blessed with a, with a chassis that was uh, powerful to pick up short yardage. Tony was different than any back that had come into the NFL at that time, and that he had blazing speed. He could start from a stop and go full speed after the second step, which is incredible. I mean, he was zero to 60 miles an hour after the second step. Dorsett coming left. He's out to the 30. Breaks to the right, 35, 40. Still on his feet at the 50. One more block. He might go. He's at the 30. He's being chased at the 20, the 15, the 10. Touchdown, Cowboys! He had that vision, uh, great vision. Uh, and he could also see into the future on plays that were designed to go to the right. He would bend it all the way back to the other side. He could just see where the hole was going to be.
the handoff goes to Dorsett, dances into the secondary and heads left. The 30, the 40, comes right to the 50, to the 40. He's going to score. Tony Dorsett, 84 yards on the touchdown. Although he started only a handful of games, Dorsett rushed for over 1,000 yards and was named the NFL's Rookie of the Year. The city of Dallas treated its heroes like Hollywood celebrities. We were it in Dallas. We were like icons, uh, rock groups, rock stars. There was Michael Jackson, then us. We played hard, we practiced hard, we worked hard, and we partied hard. <laughs> we were a partying football team. Great time to be a Dallas Cowboy. A great time. Once we got somewhere, you know, like a club or something, a line would be wrapped around the building. And, of course, here comes the Dallas Cowboys. Right away, we're ushered in. And once we're inside, the, the attention that we would get would be phenomenal. A lot of things we did back then, uh, I'm sure it wouldn't be acceptable nowadays if we had gotten caught. <laughs> uh, but we didn't get caught. We had a good time doing it. You were exposed to just about anything that you wanted to be exposed to, and and uh, and we were hoping that all of us uh, with the Cowboys kept it together. One player that Tom Landry could not keep together was Thomas Henderson, a burr under the head Cowboys saddle. I came into the Dallas Cowboys with a lot of disciplinary baggage. Um, I just didn't like authority. My rookie year when I came to training camp, he said to me, uh, you're going to have to shave that beard. I go, what, what are you talking about, shave my beard? I didn't come in to shave my beard. I came in to play football. What do you mean, shave my beard? I'm not shaving my beard. In 1975, both Henderson and number 54, Randy White, competed for the same linebacker position. So he put me and Randy White in competition for the strong side linebacker position. I embarrassed Randy White as a linebacker. I could cover the tight end. I could cover the back out of the backfield. I could whoop a tight end. After we compete for this job, and I've won the job, instead of Landry saying, Thomas, you're my starting strong side linebacker, of course I was out of position. I'm a weak side linebacker from heaven. I played out of position my whole career. After he told Randy White, you go to defensive tackle, he says, now, Thomas, you're competing with Mike Heckman now, which really angered me. I mean, you, I mean, I was angry because, frankly, I'd beat Randy White out for the strong side job, but he didn't give me that job until the beginning, the first game of the season. And when I got the job, he said to me, it was really close. You know, it, it, was, it was really, really close. As fast as Henderson ran his mouth, his legs were even faster. Thomas Henderson was the most flamboyant cowboy, a player who gave himself his own nickname, Hollywood. Tom, ever since I've known you, you've always been very low-keyed, very cool, very laid back. Are you really serious about all this Hollywood stuff? Oh, no, Jane. It's a mere myth. I had on a cowboy hat, a, a mink coat, and cowboy boots and shorts in a limo at the practice field in Dallas. So you either call somebody like that damn fool or Hollywood. So <laughs> He was charismatic and he was charming. You know, a lot of people on the team did not like him and hold it against him to this day that he brought so much attention to himself. Coach Landry said, Thomas, you're not going to play. He said, you're not going to start. It was a Saturday morning practice, which is pretty much the dress rehearsal. Thomas put on a pair of combat boots, walked outside, crossed his arms, and didn't move. And he told Coach, he said, he said, you can replace me, but you can't duplicate me. He said, if I'm not starting, I'm not playing. Hollywood was such an athletic marvel that he turned defense into instant offense in 1977. No matter how spectacular Hollywood played, Landry never praised him. He congratulated a lot of mediocre people 
but never would say Thomas had a great game. Congratulating Thomas is kind of like pouring gasoline on a fire. On the field, he often appeared disinterested. Off it, the X's and O's bored him. One day, we're in a meeting room, uh, watching film, and it's, the lights are off. And I look around, and Thomas was sleeping while Coach Landry was running the film. I had a nightlife. <laughs> and, you know, the nightlife, you know, didn't coincide with uh, 8 a.m. or 9 a.m. Uh, dark room projectors clicking to put you to sleep. And so Coach Landry got up and went over and flipped the lights on. And he said, uh, Thomas, what are you doing with those glasses on this dark room? I said, you know, because I'm cool. And when you're cool, the sun is always shining. <laughs> While Hollywood reveled in his celebrity, the Cowboys offensive line took invisibility to its extremes. Although they were the backbone of the high-scoring Cowboy offense, they took offense to any number but zero. That's what zero means is nothing, and these guys got no publicity whatsoever, and they prided themselves on uh, never being interviewed, never did any appearances as the Dallas Cowboy, uh, never bringing attention to themselves, and rarely would the coaches ever mention them. The only time they, they talked was when they were in that clique, in the Zero Club, and the only time they uh, were really asked to do interviews is when they, you know, did something negative. They relished being the Zero Club and uh, not have people talk about it. It was a catch-22 because Next thing you know, they become popular. Here we are talking about the Zero Club, and, you know, that's just not right. You're not supposed to do that. Nobody's supposed to get any publicity. Zero was not a number associated with the offense. Dallas piled up points like a pinball machine. They won their last four games to finish the season with a 12-2 and two record. Super Bowl XII was clearly in their sights. There was little drama during the regular season, and there would be absolutely none in the playoffs. The championship chase began with a mismatch against the Chicago Bears. Defensively, the whole game plan, all we heard all week long was stop Walter Payton. We stopped Walter Payton. Uh, we got a good chance to win the football game. We knew that they weren't going to be able to handle our defensive line. And Walter Payton was a great running back. The flex defense was designed to stop the run. The Bears could not run, and they were not going to pass. They had a quarterback named Bob Avellini. Uh, there's not much chance Bob Avellini yeah, you know, it's going to beat the doomsday defense. The star of the Cowboys' 37-7 victory was Charlie Waters, who intercepted a divisional playoff record three passes. Tony Dorsett rushed for almost 100 yards and scored twice. And Tony! Draw play, Dorsett to the 20, to the 15, to the 10, cuts right. He is at the 5, he scores, touchdown! What can you say? This is complete, total, utter domination. The Cowboys had one last baton pass to make on the anchor leg to Super Bowl XII. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Texas Stadium in Irving for today's National Football Conference championship encounter between the Dallas Cowboys and the Minnesota Vikings. I'm Vern Lundquist, along with Frank Lieber and Brad Sham, and the Cowboys favored to win this game and go on and meet either Oakland or Denver in the Super Bowl championship two weeks from today. Roger awaiting the snap, takes it, inside handoff, door set, right side, 10, 5, touchdown! In the NFC Championship, Tony Dorsett scored his third touchdown of the playoffs. But it was the computer mind of Tom Landry that spit out the game-changing play. He devised a strategy that exploited the aggressiveness of cornerback Bobby Bryant, number 20. The whole key to the play was the, the pump fake that Roger put on Bobby. Because Bobby was what we called back then a cluer. 
That meant a defensive back, he would look into the backfield and then pick you up as you came off the line of scrimmage. But the best way to beat them was with counter routes because the cluer would jump on the initial route. Now you pump that and then you send somebody deep, you can get somebody behind him. The key was trying to keep Bobby Bryant from reading the play and drifting back deep enough to affect the play. The 23-6 triumph propelled the Dallas Cowboys into Super Bowl XII. New Orleans, here we come. Every player that plays the game, the ultimate thing is to get there to the Super Bowl. We've made that mistake before by saying all we want to do is just get there. And we did that in 75, and we got there and lost to the Pittsburgh Steelers. So this time around, we weren't just satisfied with just getting there. Swan, what Pittsburgh said, rivalry, didn't mean anything at this point. We're this close to the Super Bowl, and we can't let this one get away. America's Game. NFL Network, football 24-7. In New Orleans, the Cowboys faced the Cinderella Denver Broncos and its Orange Crush defense. There were many delicious subplots to this Super Bowl XII matchup, but it was the quarterbacks Roger Staubach and Craig Morton who provided the most ironic twist. Kind of a special treat. I'd like to introduce you to fellas. Craig Morton, Roger Staubach. Roger, this is Craig Morton. Hello, Mr. Staubach. I've met Craig before, I believe. <laughs> Have you met before? I didn't realize that. Go hard, go hard, out of way, go hard, go hard. Number 14 wanted to be the starting quarterback of the Cowboys. Oh That's good position there. That's... No, yeah, you... For five years, he waged a bitter battle with number 12, Roger Staubach, for the job. Landry was so indecisive, so unsure of who should lead his team, that in one game he alternated the two quarterbacks on every play. He finally ended the merry-go-round by choosing Staubach. Morton was traded to the Giants in 1974 for a number one draft pick. That pick became Randy White. We felt real confident going into the game with Craig over there. We knew their offense. We felt as though we knew how to beat Craig. He wasn't going to win this one. He didn't have a chance. It was doomsday in the dome. Another day at the office for the defense. Fold, spindle, and mutilate. They overwhelmed Morton and held the Broncos to just 35 yards passing. The worst thing that Craig had going into that game was the fact that he played for the Cowboys and the fact that Coach, knew, Coach Landry knew him so well. The one thing we knew that he couldn't do was run. He had no legs to run. He couldn't scramble. So our whole philosophy on defense was to collapse that pocket around him. We designed so many blitzes on the field. I got to where I was changing blitzes on the field, drawing it up on the ground. We had a blitz with me going up the middle, and I met the fullback that was designated to block me, and I, I got through him and got an arm up on Craig's uh, chest and pulled his shirt and uh, the ball. Uh, just flooded right into Randy's hand. Doomsday was uh, pretty much unstoppable in that game. Their offensive line couldn't stop him. Craig couldn't get rid of the ball. And when he had time to throw the football, our defensive backs, our safeties were covering up their receivers. Morton will throw, has time this time. Nope, hit as he lets it go. It's intercepted again. Picked off by Aaron Kyle. Suffocating defense allowed Landry to make an aggressive play call in the first quarter. Go get it! With it fourth and one from the three, the usually conservative coach disdained three points for six. Ball on the three-yard line. Staubach has it, hands it off the door, set, drives, touchdown! Well, actually, we kind of knew we had this game won at halftime. <laughs> we were pretty much counting our money at halftime. We were, we were in control. Uh, I mean, we would really had to fall way off the cliff for us to lose this game. He had plays in there to take advantage of what these guys were given, 
to hit him for big plays to get the ball in the end zone. The first dynamic play squeezed the juice out of the Orange Crush defense. Roger goes deep across the middle, way downfield, and Bunch Johnson caught! Touchdown! A sensational diving catch by Bunch Johnson, the Cowboys' second year wide receiver! We didn't just come up with those plays on the sideline. We had worked those plays for two weeks in preparation to do those things in that game on that Sunday. Now you give two, Coach Landry two weeks to prepare, and uh, he could probably end that war in Iraq if you give him two weeks to prepare to do it, you know? I don't know why, uh, Vern, but I just have the feeling that uh, Tom Landry might have a gadget that he might want to use in a situation like this. The gadget play would be a Robert Newhouse pass. Had little hands, and uh, we we were teasing him something horrible. I thought they were just doing it as a joke uh, at the end of practice because Bob couldn't. You know, I don't think he completed one of the passes he threw in practice. God, please, ball. You know, don't be a duck. You know, a quacking duck. And he went to the right in practice every time, and the ball was set on the hash, so he had to go to his left, and he turned around and set his feet perfectly and threw an absolute perfect pass. Cowboys had buried Cinderella. They stole her handbag, crushed her corsage, and shattered her glass slipper. Craig Morton had always wanted to quarterback the Cowboys to a Super Bowl victory. On this day, sadly, he did. From the beginning of 1977 to the finish, the end result was inevitable. A world championship. Victory in Super Bowl XII. And then when the final whistle blows, you know, uh, it was a feeling of elation. We finally did it. You know, we're world champions. You know, we reached our goal. We accomplished everything we wanted to do along the way in doing that. And it was a tremendous feeling of uh, elation. We're the world champions! We're the world champions! We're the world It was a funny feeling because I was in that stadium a year previous at the University of Pittsburgh playing for a national championship. I thought that national championship was, was off the chain. <laughs> you just multiply that by 10, winning the world championship. It's just, it's just unexplainable. It does a whole lot for your team, man, when you get there and you win this damn thing. It's just unbelievable. Winning Super Bowl XII is, is my world championship. I was with 45 guys that, for better or worse, I loved every one of them. World champions! Hey, World champions! I can still say that, you know, January of 1978, I was part of the Dallas Cowboy football team that was world champion. It was a feeling of a job well done. I mean, take a deep breath, uh, just saying to yourself, hey, yeah, this is good. It's the way it's supposed to be, and all is right with the world. I'll put this football team, the 1977 football team, up against any football team in the history of the NFL. Additional video content, photo galleries, and more from America's Game, visit NFL.com slash America's Game.
NFL Network presents America's